OK, I'll start. So that'll make you sit down. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Christina Cafara. Very good morning. Welcome to all of you on behalf of of my colleagues and friends at Keystone. We have, I think, an absolutely terrific day lined up uh, when we will hear from an extraordinary group of policymakers, lawmakers, opinion makers, law enforcers, academics, all moving the dial in extraordinary ways. So I intend this day to be full of conversations that will be remembered and will somewhat awaken everyone in this community to the exceptional moment that I think we are going through. When I look back at this conference, I realized that I was aware and clearly signaling that something big was on, on, on the way, and I titled this conference in 2019, Antitrust in Time of Upheaval. The following year was Antitrust in a Multi-Shock World. Last year, it was Antitrust in Disrupted Time, as we were staring successively into the precipice of COVID, and then war, and then uh, energy, and then the lash of inflation. This year, it is antitrust and regulation and the political economy. Because I think unless anyone here has been living under a stone, we cannot fail to see what is happening all around, which has appended in many ways an entire economic philosophy. Neoliberalism, globalization, we'll hear a lot about this today, which had been the, law, the norm we've been living uh, under for the past 50 years, the only set of values most of us have known. So, as I often say, we cannot continue to party like it's 2006. Everything has changed. Industrial policy was unmentionable in policy circles until recently, and now it's everywhere. And the change, I must say, I'm so delighted that so many friends from the US are here as speakers today. The change, I think, is most extraordinarily apparent when one goes to the US and, and, and see what an incredible policy rethink is going on there, which include, un, includes antitrust, but it is much, much broader and comes out of these multiple shifts and a fashionable world polycrisis. So there is an extraordinary energy for anyone who goes to Washington today around this change. Um, and, and of course, big changes in the, U in the US radiate across the world and matter to us too. So I'm most proud that we have some of the most significant actors around this change today. Now, what has antitrust to do with any of it? In my view, a lot. We cannot continue to look back and continue to tell each other, this is what we've always done. We do things this way. Because antitrust is not just a little peripheral tool in the toolbox of the economic policy. It is an incredibly powerful tool for restructuring markets and firms, and we don't want it to be politicized, but at the same time, we cannot be a cast of Brahmins sitting in our little church and saying, this is what we've always done, it's the rule of law. This is frankly crazy. So I find calls in the US to go back to, for example, the original animating values of antitrust, things like democracy, freedom from all masters, dignity, equality, incredibly moving to me as an European. We, we have a different tradition here, but we are aligned in so many ways. So we'll talk about through all, of, all of this through the day. Um, to start of, uh, us off, I am really grateful to have uh, a real superstar of policy and enforcement recognized and claimed uh, around the world for the work she's done for a number of years. Um, she absolutely needs no introductions, but please join me in welcoming Margrethe Vestager. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Here we are, fellow uh, enforcers, uh, academics, legislators, colleagues. I think this is, uh, this is the place to be this morning in Brussels. And, uh, and when I look at the program, I also see a menu uh, that will take us through uh, the most important uh, topics uh, of the day. And I think it's, uh, it's really important because it gives us a sense of what are these historic times that we're living right now. So even more important than ever, 
coming together, listening to each other, discussing where to go next. We are in a, in a transformative phase. At least three uh, transitions are happening at the same time. The first one is geopolitical. The world is, is changing. It is changing from what we thought was a world defined by a sort of a Western, a Western-led world uh, economic order to much more multipolar uh, order, to an order where only US and Europe together has some weight compared to other markets. And that's a different world than the one we were used to. Second, there is the commitment, and now almost universally uh, accepted, for us to fight climate change, to transition our economies into net zero. And this, of course, is a major one. Probably the biggest sort of industrial transformation in 150 years. And this time it is led by policy. It's not technolo technologically driven. So moving away from our reliance on fossil fuels, increasing our use of sustainable uh, energy, and of course being much more efficient when it comes to resources. And third, there's the digital uh, transition. Uh, accelerated by the pandemic, many economies have taken a huge leap towards being much more digital, making a much better use of digital technologies in order to enhance how their economies work. And here there's no going back. All these changes, they have massive implications, uh, creating uh, new risks as well as new opportunities. And we can look uh, beyond these changes if we remain curious, alert, if we are sufficiently uh, flexible in our approach. But our fundamentals, they remain unchanged. So if we want to do what is the core of our mission, coming from the fundamentals that the integrity and the respect of the individual is where we built. How can we then sharpen the tools that we have and make sure that we have the full toolkit whenever we uh, identify uh, a gap so that we remain fully effective to make sure that we have the drive from competition and a market that truly serves the customer and the consumer. So let me uh, start with first things first, uh, the geopolitics. Because the world is in a process of rebalancing. Um, globalization is, is being sort of recalibrated. We may not decouple, but we need to de-risk the relationships we have with one another. I think this is a good thing, that this is happening. Because it means that many more countries are catching up. That we have a much more integrated world where people are at the same level. It means that millions of people are not only being lifted out of poverty, but also getting into middle classes with everything that comes with that. It also means that our markets are exposed to risks that in the past were not so significant. For example, when foreign um, governments offer large-scale subsidies to enter and to compete in our single market, or to attract investment away from Europe, well then, of course, our economies can be brought out of balance. And this is why we move forward to the foreign subsidies regulation. We will enter the enforcement phase in, in just very few months, uh, taking a targeted but decisive look at third country subsidies, that may have a negative impact uh, on the single market. And obviously, having a new tool, we are all looking forward to using it. And this new tool, I think, will turn out to be very useful 
uh, to fight uh, unfair large-scale uh, subsidies granted uh, abroad. But I find sometimes maybe we focus a bit too much uh, on the noise that is created by the announcement uh, of subsidies, that we forget about sort of the, the acquired, the careful, uh, the effective um, achievements of our long-standing state aid control framework. Because that is still the fundamental. Making sure that we do not have subsidy races, that jobs are not being relocalized because of a subsidy being bigger in another member state than in the first one, and that we fundamentally have a level playing field. Because if we only discuss the announcements of new subsidies and do not realize that the machine is working in its fundamentals, then we may miss a very important point. Our view has always been that public support has an important role to play. And the state aid that we are controlling, well, it has enabled to accelerate desirable investments like green investment, like the transition that we're in. More recently, we addressed the scale of the many crises that we're facing with the temporary uh, framework. First, we put it in place for the pandemic. Then we closed that down with uh, the pandemic. And more recently, uh, we have uh, consulted member states on turning our second framework, the one we put in place for the Russian invasion of Ukraine, that crisis framework to turn that into also a transition framework to accelerate the decarbonization and the deployments uh, of renewables as well as answering to the challenges of the Inflation Reduction Act. Because we do not shy away from subsidies in Europe. There are many. It's a lot of funding from taxpayers to shareholders. But what is important for us is that it's controlled that it's targeted, that it's transparent, and that we still have the level playing field. Because the thing is that subsidies, they bear risk to crowd out private investment, to distort competition, or to distort investment decisions that would lead us into subsidies war, subsidy wars, so being even more expensive than they would otherwise be. And that is why subsidies are not the way to competitiveness. It can be a very necessary temporary boost. But the real way to competitiveness is about innovation, skills, private capital, and of course the appropriate regulatory environment. And here in Europe, obviously also about a well-functioning single market that allows businesses to scale. In other words, as a complement to the foreign subsidies regulation, our approach must be based on effective and responsive state aid frameworks and on a vibrant single market. We want Europe where, to be a place where entrepreneurs, not taxpayers, create the jobs and the growth that Europe needs. And that, of course, is a geopolitical choice to be Europe. This leads me to the second shift, climate change and green competitiveness. And the ultimate goal of the Green Deal, I think, is clear. It is straightforward. Greening competition is a tremendous economic opportunity. Europe and the United States are both well-placed to lead in green innovation creating high-quality jobs, creating sustainable businesses. Now that the US is on board to speed up uh, the green transition, we should embrace being together in this common endeavor. Because there is no way Europe can do it alone. There's no way the US can do it alone. And the paradox is, of course, that there's enough for everyone. Because we will not have fought climate change without green industries in the US, in Europe, in India, in China, all over the planet. The thing is that this green economy should be pro-competitive. It should be driven by a level playing field. 
the kind of innovation that we need, well, it needs to, and the reason why we need it is, of course, that fighting climate change shouldn't me, make us poorer. It should make us more prosperous. Well, we need to make sure that in a net zero economy, opportunities for startups, for small businesses, well, they should be able to grow and to thrive across countries. And as competition enforces, in order to realize those gains, of course, we need to watch out to make sure that those opportunities, they are being preserved. That also in the green economy, the market is open and contestable so we can get the innovation needed. And this requires, I think, three things. First, the right balance between competition and regulation. Second, the right balance between public and private investment. And thirdly, the right balance between cooperation and competition. That balance matters for us to get to net zero fast in an affordable manner and with opportunities for everyone and not just the few who are best connected. And this is why we should be mindful of green claims to push through subsidies, regulation, less competition, if in reality it serves other purposes. I think it's really important that we have the courage to call the green bluff if we see that, in order to be able to promote the real thing. Because in addition to damaging fair competition, greenwashing plays right into the hands of those who says, no, not that important. You see, it's a fake. So I think it's really important that we are there to make sure that we do not undermine the consensus that we have gathered in the need for collective action. And this is urgent. If we ignore the economic fundamentals in a way that diminishes prosperity and cohesion, well, then I think our goals could run into a wall of political resistance. And that is why the changes that we have made to the state aid rules, well, they are carefully balanced so that um, enabled uh, subsidies, they remain tied to the market failure that they are supposed to fix. And this is not something that we compromise on because this is part of our fundamental logic. In antitrust, we have worked in, at sharpening our existing tools with new guidance on sustainability uh, agreements. That guidance was in very high demand. Uh, we have discussed it uh, in depth uh, among enforcers. Uh, and our consultations on uh, the, horizontal, uh, the guidelines for horizontal cooperation, what we have proposed is, I think, a rather careful balance when we look at all possible benefits uh, from cooperation between competitors, including, of course, the environmental ones. But we have not touched the principle that consumers in a given market cannot be worse off as our core objective as enforcers. And let me conclude with the final shift, the digital uh, one. This should be a shift with massive uh, opportunities created. And yet we have seen over years, we have seen that dominance, entrenched positions, abuse has been, well, almost the norm. It's disappointing to have to say it. But digital markets have not fulfilled their promise for small businesses to achieve scale. And they have not received what I think was also promised, the greater reach with fewer physical barriers in their way. Some say, well, politicians should be careful. I, I, I don't think that we can be accused of having been too fast. And that, of course, is an important lesson for the future. We need to anticipate and plan for change because it is an obvious fact that our enforcement, 
our legislative processes, they will always be slower than market developments. So maybe sometimes we should allow ourselves to be bold in order to be sure that we are up to the challenge. For example, it's already time for us to start asking what healthy competition would look like in the metaverse when we have competing digital realities, to wonder if there is a real new thing when we have uh, the language uh, AI models like chat GBT. Does that change the equation? Do we need to do more or something new? And obviously we have started that work. I think in the last uh, three years or so, uh, there's been a, a massive shift in how enforcers uh, and regulators in particular approach uh, digital markets. And this calls, I think, for optimism, as we can now move into a different uh, enforcement environment. There's much but greater scrutiny around the planet, and there's a much wider political debate that digital markets need careful attention. I think all jurisdictions are moving forward in one form or another. We are moving at different speeds. We will not get the same legal framework. And maybe that is not a bad thing because that will allow us to hone our toolkits in the process of mutual learning. And I think that is indeed needed, that we learn faster that we apply that learning faster, and we can only do that by working together. Here in Europe, uh, as of May, we will uh, enforce uh, antitrust alongside with the Digital Markets Act, the DMA. Work is well underway for the DMA implementation. We have a number of ongoing discussions uh, with potential gatekeepers, as well as with stakeholders in public workshops. Uh, we expect our first uh, designations uh, towards the end of summer, and this also means that we will have uh, full compliance with the Digital Markets Act's obligations and prohibitions by early next spring. But that work will not be sort of the work because alongside it, uh, we continue our work on the antitrust investigations, such as the Apple Music streaming case, the Facebook Marketplace case, or the Google uh, ad tech case. I can be a bit frustrated sometimes with the pace of antitrust. Uh, I think that is something that is shared, at least with some, maybe not always at the businesses that we investigate, but. Leave that alone. <laughs> I think we have a different sense of, of speed. The obvious thing is that we can never, ever sacrifice the work we do, the quality that we, is ba we are based on the facts of the case, the jurisprudence that we have, because we need to get the facts right. Otherwise, our cases will not stand up in court. And we cannot sacrifice that for pace. We are working as fast as possible with the businesses that we investigate, but we will never, ever sacrifice the due process. And getting things right, and of course enabling those we investigate to defend themselves, this also means that sometimes we do refocus or we reformulate our concerns. And this is what happened uh, this week with our uh, adoption of the Apple Statement uh, of Objection. We remain concerned uh, about Apple's anti-steering provisions and its impact uh, on the music streaming market. But we refocused our competition concern uh, towards the direct consumer uh, impact. Consumers are misinformed about uh, other possibilities to buy apps uh, outside the App Store. And because of that, they are paying more in the App Store for streaming their music. 
So we're looking at the same practices, but we focus on how consumers are exploited under Apple's unfair trading practices. We were always concerned about the ultimate effects on consumers. This is what we do. But instead of looking first at what anti-staring does to Apple's competitors and then to consumers, we took a more direct focus on consumers themselves. In our ongoing Facebook marketplace investigation, we are also looking at how Meta, Meta is using ad-related data from rivals, and our preliminary view is that it's an illegal, uh, unfair trading practice. What is important as enforcer is that we have our entire toolkit available to intervene. That may be interim measures, commitments, like in the recent concluded uh, Amazon case. It can be infringement decisions with fines or ex ante regulation. We need it all. And we also need for the business community to know that we have it all available. We also have a full toolbox when it comes to remedies to put an end to uh, illegal behavior or systemic non-compliance uh, under the Digital Markets Act. Structural remedies, they may be a last resort, but they are definitely a part of the antitrust and the Digital Markets Toolkit. Clearly, there is something better than breaking a business up, and that is making sure that markets do not tip in the first place. And this is why merger control also plays a very important role in the work we do. Uh, in the last few years, the scrutiny of tech mergers have certainly increased, uh, as has the frequency of uh, interventions. And I think definitely signaling a new uh, posture towards such deals. And with the Digital Markets Act, we will have a more systematic uh, overview of gatekeeper uh, acquisitions. And obviously, we remain vigilant on deals that involve large platforms with market power. As competition authorities, what I have seen through the years is that we really share a common passion for preserving opportunities, innovation, consumer choice. But we also face different legal systems with different constraints, different procedures, sometimes different standards. It's also true that consumer preference or competitive dynamics are not exactly the same in different geographies. And for many of these reasons, it can be expected that sometimes we will end up with different results. For example, on whether to accept commitments or we will end up with different uh, outcomes. What is important is, of course, that we cooperate that we cooperate as authorities and we exchange and that we learn from one another because that we can do no matter the differences uh, between us. I'll not try to offer too many sort of definitive conclusions. Also, it's the beginning of the day, so. <laughs> the triple shift is far from completed and it will continue to affect our day-to-day -day work in the coming years. For me, one thing is clear, though, even at the morning. Whatever this multipolar world order looks like, however digital we become, however much we advance on our green uh, objective in fighting climate change, I think one thing will always be true, and that is that preserving fair competition will be our fundamental driver and the driver to make our societies change for the better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you, Margrethe, and uh, delightful to hear such a broad, sweeping set of views. I won't have time for many questions, but just perhaps a follow-up. Um, it's extraordinary to hear, of course, your, your mandate is broader than just competition, but it's extraordinary to hear from a competition commissioner as well, this focus on the geopolitical change at the beginning of your speech. And certainly the balance between uh, competition and industrial policy and uh, uh, those, those pursuits through the last years of your, your mandate has changed. How do you think now that kind of colors the priorities that you pursue in antitrust? How does that fit together going forward? As you said yourself in, in, in your welcome to us, uh, one must have been sleeping under a stone if not realizing that the world is changing. And um, as I said in, in, in my remarks, it's important to see all the things we do and not just sort of, uh, sort of the, the, the announcement, the sparkle, the noise that takes our attention. Because if, if we are to be successful, uh, if we are to keep innovating, and th there's, there's no way that we can manage in these challenges without innovating, then we need competition as a driver. Uh, we know, I think, from economic history that in, uh, in situations where um, legislators or politicians have, have tried to sort of set competition on hold, it has been a very, very costly lesson. Uh, now we have war in Europe, uh, I think it's a, it's a stark reminder uh, of the negative role of monopolies uh, in the time between the world wars. Uh, the reason why we do what we do is, is not a light reason. It's not just because competition is nice. It's because it's absolutely needed in order for economies to stay healthy and because of that also for democracies to stay healthy. Uh, so I, I think you're completely right when you welcome us to say that we live indeed in historical times. And we should not think of ourselves as in some small corner, but as someone who's actively enabling a world that can develop for the better. Thank you. Join me in thanking the commissioner again. We, in the interest of time, are going to move on uh, to thank you.